Hey folks, Nick here from another BookTube channel, and today I'll be reviewing The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan, book two of The Wheel of Time. This is going to be a spoiler-free review of this book, though I am going to mention stuff that happened in the first book, Eye of the World. So if you're not caught up, just be mindful of that going in. Uh, you can also check out my review of Eye of the World uh, if you'd like to start from the beginning. Um, this is my reread of The Wheel of Time, so I'm going to be coming at this from a perspective of someone who's uh, who read it once a while ago and is now revisiting it for the second time. Just like I did with The Eye of the World, I'm going to try to keep the plot synopsis to this as simple as possible, just pare it down to its barest essentials. Uh, so just bear with me uh, with this. Um, the Horn of Valir, which is an item of great importance, uh, it can call the ghosts of heroes past uh, back to the battlefield, uh, and which will be critical to fighting the Dark One at the last battle, has been stolen by Dark Friends. Rand, Matt, and Perrin team up with a group of Shinaran soldiers to recover the horn before they're able to sound its call. Meanwhile, Nynaeve and Egwene set off for the White Tower in Tarvalon to begin their Aes Sedai training. As a backdrop to all of this, foreign invaders called the Shan Chan have landed in the west in Falm. They bring with them massive beasts, unlike anything anyone has ever seen before, but the most terrifying weapon that they have are captured women who can channel the One Power. With these leashed Damane, as they call them, the Shan Chan plan to conquer the continent, claiming rights to it based on their ancestry. I loved this book the first time I read it, and I loved it just as much this time around as well. I remember after finishing book one, uh, the first time I read the series, I liked it, but I wasn't overly eager to continue. Uh, but it was this book that really got my attention and it made me sure that I wanted to actually follow through all the way to the end. I think what really stands out about The Great Hunt is that it's a bit more of a conventional fantasy narrative than the first book was. In Eye of the World, all of the things that are set up ultimately lead to a climax that feels, like, unrelated. But with The Great Hunt, we have a very simple premise. There's a magical item, it fell into the bad guy's hands, the good guys need to go on a fetch quest to get it back. Super clear plot, and you know exactly what the stakes are, and what the win condition is. Furthermore, all of the other threats that are introduced now feel stronger contextually because we understand how exactly they are working against our primary goal. Speaking of those other threats, the Shan Chan are the greatest literary villains I have ever read in my life. Like, just in terms of pure hatred. They are so vile. They're so easy to hate, I literally, I feel my blood boiling when I read their chapters. Slavery is horrible, goes without saying. In my opinion, it's the single worst thing humans have ever come up with. But what the Shan Chan do to Damane is so much more than just slavery, because the control doesn't even end at physical control. The handlers who hold the leash of the Damane form a mental connection with them, and so there is no escape at all for them, even in their minds. Even the slightest thought of escape or fighting back is enough for them to experience excruciating pain. They don't even view the Damane as human. They shred these women's identities away completely, and they treat them closer to weaponized pets than anything. It is absolutely infuriating to read about them patting Damane on the head like dogs when they behave properly. And the way that Jordan uses the Shan Chan in The Great Hunt is perfect. He's introduced us to a whole bunch of characters who can channel the One Power. And then he introduces us to a group of villains that enslave people who can channel the One Power. I wonder how these two things are gonna connect. Okay, let's talk a bit about our characters and how they're doing this time around. 
Uh, Rand found out in the last book that he can channel and that he's destined to go insane. Rough. So naturally, when this book starts, he's paranoid that Moraine and the other Aes Sedai are going to gentle him, which is bad. But also, maybe it's good, because if they don't, he may accidentally kill everyone that he loves, which is also bad. So he's in a pretty tough spot, um, and it only gets tougher for him as the book progresses. For instance, when Rand ends up in the city of uh, Kyrian, he is mistaken for a lord, which attracts unwanted attention from the other noble houses of the city. This drags Rand into Dias de Mar, or the Great Game, or the Game of Houses, in which every single small action taken by a member of one of the houses is considered to be part of some kind of political maneuvering. Even the decision to not play the game, which Rand tries, is taken as evidence that he is obviously planning something massive. Rand was incredibly frustrated by this, and I was right there with him. I think Dias de Mar would drive me mad faster than the One Power does. Egwene and Nynaeve both are given more time to shine in this book, which really helps solidify their personalities a bit more. Egwene is a bit of the ideal student, uh, eager to learn the ways of the Aes Sedai, willing to practice, willing to follow the rules, uh, which is contrasted um, with Nynaeve's almost belligerent attitude towards her education. She doesn't want to learn so much as she needs to learn so that she can get back at Moraine for dragging them all out of Emmons Field in the first place. Both characters get more of what they want by the end of the book, though it's accomplished in a very different way than they were both expecting. It's also through their storyline that Jordan is able to unfurl even more world-building drama to us. We've learned in the past about the Aes Sedai and their different Ajahs, but now that we get to spend time in the White Tower, we discover just how divided the group really is. Their squabbles don't amount to just minor disagreements and ideologies, but are now bubbling into a borderline rebellion within the tower. And to make matters worse, rumors of the existence of the Black Aja, who are Aya Sedai bound to the Dark One, are gaining a lot of traction. The Great Hunt proves that Robert Jordan was a tremendous storyteller, able to weave multiple plot lines and characters together in a seamless, effective way for maximum drama. I didn't cover anywhere close to everything in this review. I didn't even mention the Forsaken, or the Portal Stones, and the alternate worlds, or Hurin the Sniffer, the greatest side character uh, in literature history. Uh, I'm just going to leave you guys to discover those things on your own. I would say, if even if you didn't love The Eye of the World, read this book and then decide if you want to continue with The Wheel of Time, as I think this is more indicative of what you can expect from the whole series. My arbitrary and subjective grade for The Great Hunt by Robert Jordan is 9 out of 10. Do with that what you will. Uh, let me know how where the, where the Great Hunt falls in your ranking of Wheel of Time books. Obviously, it's really high up on mine. Um, it was the first time I read it. I'm glad to see it still is this time around. Uh, but let me know your thoughts about this book in the comments below. Thank you for spending some time with me today. But now, it's time to get back to reading.